Um, and before I introduce Sister Hanim, I, I wanted to say that you, those of you who know me, you know that I'm a big, big, big on stressing, discovering, preserving, perpetuating our history as a people here in America. And this is particularly important uh, during this day and time because we are, uh, we have a younger generation now uh, that are coming up, uh, Muslims in America of uh, varying ethnicities. And uh, I have found, as someone who embraced Islam as a young person, I was 20 years old when I took Shahada, and uh, I have found that there is a um, disconnect in the transmission of legacy between those of us who are legacy leaders and the uh, emerging leaders from amongst the uh, 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 younger generation. A uh, case in point would be the lecture that we're going to hear this evening. There are those in America, those uh, Muslims of uh, immigrant origin, Arabs, particularly Arabs, South Asians, etc., and even those who are um, uh, African Americans and others who think that the current movement to connect um, knowledge of self spiritually with knowledge of self with regards to uh, ethnicity and culture and things of that nature, there are people who think that that's new. That's not new. In fact, it's old. And somewhere along the way, um, that type of teaching associated with Islam uh, became uh, disconnected. Uh, in the masjids, for instance, one of the pioneers of Islam in the city of uh, Philadelphia, commonly known as the city of brotherly love, I refer to it as the Muslim city, black Muslim city. Okay? So one of the pioneers of Islam in Philadelphia was the late Sheikh uh, Nafi Muhammad. He is the father of Imam Anwar Muhammad and, uh, and, uh, and his brother. Back in the 1930s, 1940s, when Islam was being established in the city of Philadelphia amongst African-American Sunni Muslims, everybody with me so far, African-Americans who were practicing the Sunnah. You would go to the masjid, those masjid established by uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, and at those masjids that were in African-American neighborhoods, you could go there, you could um, take shahada, you could learn all of the things that we learn as Muslims, Tahara, and Salah, and learn about Zakat, etc. Maybe a little Quranic, Arabic, a little Fusha. But in addition to those subjects, also at the Masjid, they taught African history, African, African American history. In fact, uh, 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 the late scholar J. A. Rogers was a major source of teaching and instruction in those masjids. Some, and someone might ask, well, why is that? Why would black Americans go to the masjid and learn about other aspects of human identity? And the answer is because we are people who've been separated from our identity. We are people who uniquely suffer from a fracturing of cultural identity that is unique amongst Muslims, unique problem. So our 20th century ancestors who established Islam in this country, they saw 
Deen al-Islam as a vehicle for healing our people, for reuniting our fractured consciousness, and for social reform, and all of those other elements. So it's not a matter of uh, am I a uh, Muslim or am I African or am I this? No, you all that at the same time. Same way that we are all uh, male or female and in the Islamic worldview, that's it. You heard what I said, right? You either, you either male or you female. That's the Islamic worldview from the language. Every single word in the Arabic language, every single word is either male or female. And so our founding Imam, Sheikh Alama Tawfiq, Rahmatullahi, he used to say to us, he said, uh, in the Arabic language, he says, no such thing as a nuda gender. And I always remind myself now, like uh, turned on the news, Sister Hanima, about two weeks ago, and the MTA was announcing that they were, were getting ready to issue a gender neutral metro card. So I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what is gender got to do with a metro card, you know? But again, this is just typical of the confusion of the time. But each of us, we have a gender identity, we have a spiritual identity, we have an ethnic identity, we're human beings, you know, we, we're uh, of the human species. We're not a this or that, we're a this and a that. And so uh, Dr. Torre, uh, has brought us, and uh, I know from my uh, conversations with Sister Hanima over the past couple of years, actually, uh, she has been uh, exploring this whole issue of identity and the complexities uh, of identity. And so uh, Sister Hanima, and you can read our bio for yourself. I'm gonna mention a couple of things that are not on the bio. Like I really want to emphasize that, you know, she is one of the leaders of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. In this Jamaat, we have both men and women who are in positions of leadership, and it's been that way for about 40 years or so. Again, that's not new for us. Most of you probably don't know that at one time, uh, Dr. Hanima Torre was the chairman of the MIB Board of Directors. That was like around 1991, uh, 1991, something like that, right? Uh, it was Sister Hanima Torre, Dr. Hanima Torre, who recruited me as a young person. She's the only member of the congregation now who's been here longer than me. So when you look at her, you can tell that she was here from when she was a little girl, right? So, uh, uh, so when I took Shahada at 20 years old, Dr. Torre was, and pay attention, she was surveying the young talent that was joining the, uh, the Jamaat, and uh, which is what we need to be doing. We need to not just be letting people of the younger generation come in and go out, without making a conscious effort to engage them, to recruit them. And Dr. Torre, uh, knowing that I was uh, uh, a writer, uh, at that time I was an artist, performing artist, you remember that, Mikael? Performing artist, and so she, uh, and, and that same year that I took Shahada, which was in 1971, was the year that MIB founded Ashuruk Shamsu Maghrabiya, the, the Western Sunrise, our newspaper. So she, uh, I think I took Shahada in April 71. We launched the Western Sunrise, which published from 1971 to 1981. We launched the Western Sunrise in September. 1971. So immediately she recruited me as uh, you know someone who could write for the newspaper, etc. Eventually, I was uh, became the person in charge of a layout for the newspaper. Uh, Brother Mikael Abdul Samad, right here, who is the father of our party, 
uh, and half is Uthman Abdul Samad. Brother Mikael was the uh, art director for the newspaper, etc. So I'm, I'm giving you these few little tidbits, and we're going to bring her on, to go along with her impressive credentials that you see here. She is a veteran member of the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. She is a leader in her own right. You'll see it says she was a student and wife of the late Sheikh Alama al Hajj K. Ahmed Tawfiq, the founding Imam, and that's true. But additionally, she is a leader in her own right. She's a person recognized and respected in her own right. So we are pleased and honored to uh, host this lecture tonight by our beloved sister, uh, Dr. Halima Torre. And so we will now call her to the microphone. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Takbir. 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 Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa rahmatullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa bilalameen. I appreciate Shukran, your presence here, alhamdulillah, and Shukran, I'm honored by the invitation, alhamdulillah. Um, and yes, I have been thinking about the issues that we're going to talk about tonight, and I certainly want to engage in conversation. It's not just me talking, but sharing too, because probably each person here has something to contribute to this conversation about identity and if you are a Muslim of African descent, an African American Muslim, um, you have some stories. <laughs> okay. So the idea, and I'm going to talk about how I came to this. It was actually here at Salatul Juma, after Salatul Juma, in our temporary sisters area. I happened to hear an African-American sister say, and this was, I think, in June, just this June. She said, um, she was talking to another sister, and she said, well, I just consider myself Muslim. That's it. So that was how she identified herself, OK? And this I hadn't heard. I was in. Um, Los Angeles this summer and I was sitting outside waiting for my son and um, and um, youngish mature African-American male so you know because I was Muslim and he asked very polite excuse me but um, can I ask you a question please and he said you know the Arabs enslaved the Africans us he's African-American he said so why is it, why should we be Muslim? Why should African Americans be Muslims? And I said, well, I haven't heard that one in a long time. We used to get this, you know, way back when, <laughs> okay? And I said, hmm. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, well, tell me this. You know that it was primarily people who claimed to be Christian who were the um, slave traders on the transatlantic slave trade and that moved the greatest population of humanity into slavery in almost the known human history. So doesn't that mean we, why should we be Christians? Why should any of us even be Christians? He says, well, that's a good point, you know. Um, so to me, this was, all right, then if we are African American, and notice it says African American, it didn't say black American, it said African American, and we're Muslim. Um, how do each of those identifiers, those labels, impact us? I mean, what does it mean, really? Because there are labels and there are labels. You can call yourself anything, but what do they mean? So if we are African American Muslims, what does it mean? And first, I wanted to talk about culture, because as you saw what the title is, and it's about um, this issue of culture and consciousness. By that, I mean how aware are we, as the young folks would say, how woke are we, <laughs> um, in terms of what that means, awareness. And um, this idea of identity, what kind of labels do we use to even identify ourselves, uh, to ourselves and even in the public? Shukran. <laughs> um, and then, 
how does the Dean of Law impact our identity? Uh, so I want to take some time to just talk about a couple of those identifiers. And if you could see, that's why I gave you the handout too, because talking about culture, and you could see from my bio, yes, I teach um, multicultural studies, so we're always looking at issues of culture, and these are primarily with young people, although older people, and what culture means and how it impacts existence. Um, so, about culture. Now you see I gave you a list of definitions, right? Because all of these are the terms when you're talking about culture, these are the kinds of things that come up. And how do you define culture? First look at that definition. Now the little one right here just says it's some total of a way of life learned, valued, and shared by a group. Their beliefs, their social forms, and their materials. And notice it says shared by a group. So no individual can say, well I have my culture. <laughs> uh, you didn't bring yourself into the world, you didn't raise yourself, uh, so you can't say, I have my culture. No, it is always shared when we're talking about this. You are part of a group, whether you recognize it or not. Um, and the other part where it says the ever-changing values, the traditions, the social and political relationships, and the world view created, shared, and transformed, again, by a group of people bound together by a combination of factors that can include a common history, geographic location, language, social class, and religion. Um, now the other is, you know, um, sometimes it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it sounds a little complicated, where it says a set of human-made objective and subjective elements. And that's important because it's human-made. Humans have created certain kinds of practices. Uh, human-made objective and subjective elements that in the past have increased the probability of survival. So culture is about survival. And it resulted in satisfaction for the participants in an ecological niche, you know, someplace on the planet, somewhere, and thus became shared, and again that thing about sharing, shared among those who could communicate with each other because they had a common language and lived in the same time and place. <coughs> now, just looking at the top above that definition where it says characteristics of culture, you can see that shared, transmitted from generation, it goes from one to the other, but from past to present to future, etc., It is based on symbols. How do we transmit it? Through symbols, and one of the big symbols is language. Language is a symbol system. Um, among other things, of course, there are what, statues, there are um, other kinds of um, amulets or whatever you can use that symbolize something. And of course, we know the symbol in Islam about the star and the crescent. You see that, you think Islam. Um, also that it is something that is learned. Nobody is born with this. So it is something that we learn. And also it's dynamic, which means that it changes. It is not static. It is not, you know, a thousand years old, okay? So it has changed. It is dynamic. And it is open to forces of, um, that are not, how do we say, um, from other people. From when you move from one place to another, that could affect your practices and your behavior. Uh, the next is how culture is learned. How do we do it? Through proverbs, and we all know about proverbs, right? Uh, through folk tales, legends, and myths, through art, and through media, through media. And some of these will come up a little later. Um, and then the elements of culture, worldview, very important concept, worldview, religion, history, values, social organizations, language. Now, if you would go down the sheet to worldview, because, um, What is it? Yeah, it's how do you see the world? How does any individual see the world? And what is that based on? What the group has, has identified? Um, a culture's orientation towards God, humanity, nature, the universe, life, death, sickness, and other philosophical issues concerning existence. So the world view, how do we see the world? Um, very important, 
the concept, and you'll see there in the definitions, beliefs, values, and norms. Each one of us has them, beliefs, values, and norms, as individuals and the groups we were raised in, that we learned our culture from. So what are beliefs? And most, most of the time when students hear this, they always say, oh yeah, you know, that means religion. And you notice in the definition, religion is not there. It says conventions concerning true or false assumptions. What do you consider to be true? What do you consider to be false? Not true. That's what you believe. Values. What are values? Standards by which a group decides what is good or bad, what is desirable or undesirable. So just as we're teaching our children, we're teaching them certain things. We're trying to inculcate certain values in them. To be honest, to be courageous, to be truthful, to be the, those are values. Uh, norms, norms, society's rules of what you consider right and wrong, acceptable or unacceptable, appropriate, inappropriate, that guide the behavior of its members. And notice what it says, norms can change over time as illustrated by norms regarding sexual behavior, dress code, and other things, okay? So you look through that, yes, that's about change, norms. Um, and even, you, you know, in different families even, you might recognize different norms and to what degree you recognize certain norms or what, what you consider appropriate or inappropriate. Um, so these are some core pieces of, uh, when we're talking about culture, these are, this is part of the vocabulary. And another term here, the subculture, the subculture, because on one level, you know what, that's what we are. African American Muslims, we are a subculture. What does that mean? It designates cultural patterns that set apart some segment of a society's population based on age, ethnicity, residence, sexual preference, occupation, and many other factors. And those of you know, especially if you have embraced Islam, or reverted to Islam as an adult, um, that, wait a minute, you may be separated from your family, who are African Americans, you know, because they don't quite live the way you live or you're trying to live. So then you become another subculture. African Americans are being considered a subculture of the American culture. There are a lot of subcultures. So we end up being a subculture of the African American population. So what does that all mean, though? And how do we particular? those of us who fall in, under that label, how do we deal with it? How do we handle it? How do, how do we see it, okay? Um, and now down at the bottom, you will see here, you know, it's all in these italics. Universal survival system. This has to do with being a human being, being a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are major systems of various survival systems that anthropologists and sociologists have found and listed amongst the world's diverse culture. Wherever you go on the planet, you will see a group of people having or representing some of these systems. For example, marriage and family system. How do you perpetuate your species? You come together and you have to nurture and um, grow your future. Uh, systems of governance and social control. And notice it doesn't say government, it says governance, and the word's very important. It says governance. Why? It means every, whenever you get a group of people together, you have a way, you organize how you're going to act as a group. What's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what are the rules, what are the regulations, who speaks first, whatever, whatever. Those govern behavior. Those are rules, and ideally people agree on them. So when we talk about system of governance, now when we talk about governments, which are forms of governance, there are many. We happen to live in one that's called the democracy, um, and supposedly a government by and for the people and of the people, okay? Of course, there are other types of government, you know, that are dictatorships. There are other types that are monarchies, um, although monarchies are going down, you know, they're not as um, numerous as they used to be on the planet. Um, and now, with governance is social control, because guess what? When you end up having rules and regulations, it's okay, who's minding the store? Who's determining, you know, what happens when somebody breaks the rules? What happens when somebody breaks the law? So there are consequences. Who are the people who are 
set up to do the social control. What's the first group that comes to your mind? Hmm? The police, right, yeah. So they're instruments of social control. And that doesn't give you any positive or negative connotation because every society has somebody who's doing the policing, okay? And in some societies, guess what? Every human being, every person in that society is the police, meaning you're so invested in the society and the success of the society, you're checking, you're checks on one another. And you're not resenting anybody because you're saying it's supposed to be for the common good. It's supposed to be to help make life good for all of us, okay? Um, the next is the communication system. Of course, the most obvious is language. You know, everybody's got a language. That's something that the creator endowed us with. And the human is, the, the homo sapiens is uniquely endowed with this uh, speech ability. It's amazing. And of course, there are other, you know, sign language, even we call it smoke signals, all those are communication systems, right? Um, economic system, the economic system, maybe I get to that last. The supernatural religious system. Now, the two go together here because what is it there? Every human, I guess, in recorded history and before then, has tried to figure out how do you explain, how do you come to understand the things? that you don't understand. <laughs> how do you account for them? How do you, how do we get here? They want to answer these questions. Who made the sky? You know, what, what does it do? Where that rain come? Where does it come from? So how, how are these questions answered? So there's a way of, of that humans have tried to figure this out and answer these questions. And then of course, religious systems, different religions, um, doctrinal ways of looking and uh, living on the planet. Then an education system. And here, don't think about schools. Don't think about, you know, teacher and student and that kind of thing in the chair, the desk. The, the. Think about transmission of knowledge. Think about transmitting what one knows to somebody else. So what kinds of systems have been set up in order to transmit knowledge? Um, and we'll talk a little more about this when we get into the um, move to the African American piece. Um, <clears throat> then healthcare and medical systems. And guess what? You know, we talk about modern medicine and all that other stuff, which you know, old stuff and whatnot. And the thing is, if it didn't work, guess what? We would not be here. <laughs> so clearly, the ancients knew what they were doing. They knew about healing. They knew about what the natural substances were that could help to heal, and in terms of both physical, psychological, and spiritual, they had remedies for these kinds of ailments. Um, so every society has some way of diagnosing and then healing, and had theories of disease, not just one, theories of disease, plural, why we get sick. And then this last one is the economic system. And economic, a lot of times, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is money, you know? But think about this. There were days when there was no, end quotes, money as we know it, currency, bills, coins, those kinds of things. So when we're thinking about economics, think in terms of the production, the manufacture, uh, and distribution of goods and services, the things in life, the material culture, the things we need in order to survive. They had to get produced by somebody, manufactured, and then how are they distributed in the society? And there are different systems for doing that. We live in a society that is a free market capitalist society. And um, other societies, they might call it a socialist society, or a communist society, or a bartering society, or however. So think in terms, and these are, like I said, big ideas versus our little, you know, the dollars and cents we have in our pockets when we're talking about economics. Um, high culture, look at that, high culture, popular culture. High culture refers to cultural patterns that distinguish a society's elite. I always, I often ask people, I say, how many of you listen to Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms? <laughs> As a student, a lot of them, they never even heard of them. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> They'll say, was that right, right, right? Well, we live in a society that's basic, its basic foundation was white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism. The people who founded this republic 
called the United States of America came from the what we call today UK, United Kingdom, or Britain, or England, however you want to call it. They had a certain culture. And that's what they brought here. The Europeans brought their culture, right? They were the boss, they were in power. Mm. But it also, then it says, those who are a distinguished society's elite, when we say elite, what, what do we mean by elite? Do we mean just people in power? Generally, and how do you determine power? Determine elite in any society. Generally, people say, oh, well, the, the wealth they have. That's people who are wealthy. And, but it's not just wealth. Sometimes it's the family, kinship systems, the, the, the people, the families who are influential in any given society. And especially, you know, if you're in a, in a society where, say, they've had fought for independence, you know, the, the people who led the fight for independence in that country may not be rich, but they are influential. They are considered the elite. If you're a member of that family, you know, you are highly respected. So it's not just about money. It's about reputation. It's about rep deeds that you've accomplished. Um, and then it may be political power or certain status or offices that you hold. Um, now, popular culture, so we all know what that is. And it designates cultural patterns widespread among a society's people. And that's going to come up a little bit when we talk about African American um, culture, because the a lot of contemporary popular culture in the United States, if not the world, has been put forth and put out there by African Americans. You know what culture I'm talking about? Hip hop. Hip -hop. <laughs> I used to say, you know, you go to Europe, all you had to do was look at shoes, and you could not tell what, what country anybody came from. Why? They all had athletic shoes and Nikes or whatever. What I'm like, wow. Um, and all of them had their form of hip hop or so called rap or whatever. Um, so, in terms of this spread and cultural spread, <laughs> um, very interesting. So, that's just some background piece about culture. And the next sheet you have, and you can see it's the iceberg. The iceberg, and of course, the iceberg is a metaphor, and it uses a metaphor for culture. Why? Because, frankly, most of us are not so much aware of our culture unless we're around people who don't share the culture. And then you say, what? Where's the bacon and eggs for breakfast? <laughs> You're in, uh, where are you? You're in Uganda. I'm so, why are you looking for bacon and eggs? <laughs> Understand? Well, isn't that what people eat for breakfast? No, that's what your people eat for breakfast. And most of us think, you know, our world is the world. It is not, <laughs> okay? And we're actually, Part of, a very small part of the world, okay? So the idea is then, if you're looking at the iceberg, what is it, you notice there are two, there's a line that separates, surface culture and deep culture. What's the biggest part of an iceberg? It's always what you can't see, what is underneath the water. And if you look at all of these items, all these features, these are things that we all have and partake in, but we may not be conscious of. But we are conscious of surface culture. You know, we talk about the arts and literature, music, dance, games, cooking, dress, all those things, material culture. We call it primarily in our awareness. We know about those things. But in terms of deep culture, it's primarily out of our awareness. So, for example, I'm just going to take a few of these because um, ah, conception of beauty, conception of beauty differs from culture to culture, okay? Um, and it's interesting because we live in a society where, although it's starting to shift, I've seen in my lifetime it's starting to shift, that the standard of beauty, especially for a woman, was the white female the white woman. And I used to say, hmm? You think it still is, huh? Well, the other piece was when I think about this, I'm saying, because we've got more variety now. And I remember, frankly, when I was working on a magazine, Red Book Magazine, way back when, you didn't see any black women on the cover. And as a matter of fact, in the article's editor was a, um, he was Jewish. And I remember asking him at the time. I said, well, because I don't know, it was a feature article on religion. And the figure to represent, because images are very important, uh, to represent religion 
was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant like minister or, or model who had a collar. And I once asked him, because he was Jewish, I said, well, what if there were a rabbi, you know, on the cover? He says, oh, no, we couldn't do that. Why? Because in this culture, that image was not representative of the broad default religion, okay? Just like the default in terms of beauty was whiteness, the default in terms of religion in the United States was Protestant. So just imagine who that left out. The Jews, um, well at that time, we'd, hmm, Catholics, yeah, absolutely. So no, you didn't have the priest. So this idea of what we choose to represent, and we call the image of this big picture and this big concept, that's chosen, that's, that's chosen by human beings. And a lot of that based on cultural reference, that sometimes they're not conscious of. They say, well, of course, you know. Yeah, the minister. Oh, okay. And again, okay, and notions of modesty, and this is certainly part of Islam, too, but it's part of the general culture. And what does it mean to be modest? And modesty is, includes dress, how you, what garments you put on, but it also is in terms of how you conduct yourself, in terms of, um, you know, every time you do something, are you always bragging about it? <laughs> what? Make sure everybody knows you did it. Um, or um, or not. Humility, as they say, the Prophet, والسلام, you know, say humility is one of the uh, virtues um, that we should be aiming for. So notions of modesty, conception of beauty, ideals governing child raising. Um, children, you know, folks have different views of raising kids, raising children, excuse me, I won't say kids. Why? Those are baby goats. So <laughs> remember, Sheikh used to talk about that. Don't call children kids. <laughs> um, what do you see when you see a child? What do you think your role is if you are a parent? What are you trying to uh, achieve in raising this child? What ideas are in your head about this child? Um, and that's a lot of responsibility. You know, you're raising up the next generation. So what is in your head, in your cultural tradition or whatever, um, regarding uh, child rearing? Uh, rules of descent, that has to do with, okay, when we pass on, what happens to what's left behind? What are the rules or laws or whatever that govern inheritance, we call them inheritance laws. Um, and again, you'll notice something like patterns of superior subordinate relations, who's on top, who's on the bottom, and how do you conduct yourself. Courtship practices, now we don't even use this word courtship in the United States in 21st century. But whenever that's used, the word courtship, and like the young people might say, well, you're hooking up, you're going out, I'm going with someone, you know, we live together, whatever, whatever. Um, that particular word relates specifically to marriage, meaning you are, when you use the word courtship, it means the goal is not hanging out. It means I'm looking for a spouse. I'm looking for a mate. And how do I once, and what governs how you meet, how you get to know one another, and then uh, cement the union, okay? Um, yeah, now, conception of justice. Uh, notions of leadership, attitudes towards a dependent, attitudes towards a dependent. Every society has people who are dependent. And you can name right away, who are the groups that are dependent because they can't help themselves? Who? Infants, the people who are sick, sick. Elderly who can't work anymore. So every society has people who are dependent on others. So notice it says attitudes towards the dependent. Some folks say, I mean, they look at everybody and say, well, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know. Don't bother me with your problems. What? But there's always something. And here in this country, it's often uh, what the, the views are Put, different views are put to the Republicans and the Democrats. Republicans, or they say the conservatives, you know, Democrats, for the social good, we help, social welfare, etc. And um, the um, Republicans are the conservatives who say, well, listen, that's for the states, it's not for federal government, small government, oh, that's for your family to take care of, not me, not that. So all of these things under the iceberg go to the surface in terms of policy making. Um, 
and laws that end up getting passed. Um, and now here, just one or two others, roles in relation to status by age, sex, class, occupation, kinship, and so forth. If you are of a certain age group, there are expectations about you. Your role, um, sex, referring to if you're male or female, how does society view, uh, or that culture view, males and females in relation to one another, um, social class, what kind of jobs, occupations, you know, have status or not, um, kinship, who your family is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just uh, one or two other notions of adolescence, notions of adolescence. Um, you know, the United States has been critiqued in terms of always prolonging adolescence. In other words, my goodness, what? No, you got to play. I mean, boy, Americans are great at playing. You know, in the teenagers, you expect, play, you know, go, have a good time. Da, 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 da. Whereas there are other cultures, you know, certain European cultures, you know, by the time you're 15 or 16, what? You got to trade, you're trying to do some work, you got responsibility, you know. So it's like, and it's certainly African societies, right? So it's like notions of adolescence, what, what age range, you know, what are you supposed to be doing? What are your expectations at any given time? Yeah, and what are the expectations of a child, your adolescence, then your young adult, etc. How does the society view and how they set up their social organizations and structures to create and develop that? Um, Body language, body language. What's appropriate, not appropriate, and that goes to you know how you sit, how you stand, how you greet one another, and all those kinds of things. And um, the other piece of ha uh, patterns of handling emotions, patterns of handling emotions. Yes, yeah, certain cultures, you know, are reserved cultures. No, they don't show much emotion. Others, you know, you just say, oh, how happy I am, and they start crying. <laughs> Very, you know, surface emotions. Others are not. Just different cultural values. Um, so that's just all of that. And by the way, each one of these in some form or fashion is affecting all of us as individuals, whether we're conscious of it or not. How we see things, they contribute to this world view that um, any of us has. Now, the last one, and first, um, I want to stop. You'll see that last sheet, because we'll talk about that in a minute. And it's this concept of race, the concept of race. We live in what's called a racialized society, a racialized society. What does that mean? It means that race has such a strong meaning. Guess what? In other times in history, mm-mm. Uh, it says down here, you know, the word race did not appear in the English language until 1508 word race, right? We can't imagine a world without this concept of race. So this idea of unity in terms of color, everyone who's ever heard of John Henry Clark, um, Dr. John Henry Clark, right? We know what a Pan-Africanist he was, right? And he always said, never in the history of humankind has a people united on the basis of color alone. They, they come together based on ideology. Why? Well, Africans fight Africans on the continent. Mm -hmm. Europeans fight Europeans on their continent, etc. So this whole idea, I'm just gonna get this thing about race and ethnicity. Race, it is considered a social construct, not a biological fact. There is no such thing as a race gene. And you know, they have mapped the genome, you know, human genome and blah, blah, blah. They have not identified anything that says, oh, oh, that clearly they're the black race or whatever they're going to call you. Oh, they are the yellow race. No such gene exists. And as you would see here, whether they say race has no genetic basis, not one characteristic trait or even gene distinguishes all the members of one so-called race from all members of another so-called race. Number five, most variation is within, not between, and notice races is in quotation marks, of the small amount of total human variation, 
85% exist within any local population, be they Italians, Kurds, Koreans, or Cherokees. About 94% can be found within any continent. That means two random Koreans may be as genetically different as a Korean and an Italian. Um, so race, as scientists would say, race is a social construct, not a biological fact. So the question then is, what was the function of constructing race theory? What was the function of creating race theory? And what does it say? And it was in 1508 um, that that word race, as we understand it today, came into being in the English language. It's considered a modern idea. It has not, human subspecies don't exist. So we can't say, oh, one's a higher or a lower species. That's not how we deal with um, uh, humanity, homo sapiens. Skin color really is only skin deep. Most traits are inherited independently from one another. Genes influencing skin color have nothing to do with the genes influencing hair form, eye shape, blood type, musical talent, athletic ability, or forms of intelligence. Knowing someone's skin color doesn't necessarily tell you anything else about him or her. Um, also, six, about slavery predates race, because most societies or a uh, large number of human societies have had have enslaved other people uh, for various reasons. And what we, though, in our time understand is that it's perhaps the first time that such massive slavery was perpetrated on one group of people from one geographical area, meaning Africa, continent of Africa. Um, this concept of race and freedom evolved together. Oh, race justified social equalities is natural. Any of you who know the work of um, uh, Francis Cress Welsing, <laughs> okay, in terms of the race confrontation theory and this issue about, um, wow, how is it that the Europeans came up with this concept? And um, in a nutshell, you know, as I always understood this, it was that, well, when they started going out around the world and they realized that they were indeed were a minority because guess what? The majority of people on the planet are people of color, <laughs> okay? So the Europeans have always been a minority. And then going out and around the world, they're like, wow, and the riches in these lands in Africa, you know, the gold, the, the riches in so many of these places. They say, how can we get them? So you develop the concept of inferiority. You build your story. You build your myth. You build your legend to justify how you can do almost anything to any group of people. So it said what race justifies social inequalities is natural. Well, those inferior people, they don't know how, what to do with their land. They don't know how to mine this. They don't know how to mine. Oh, they don't have the intelligence, and they develop. I mean, if you read about this history around the race piece and what they develop, measuring the brain, and saying the size of brains and then the shape of brains and how the Europeans were superior and the uh, it, it's amazing I mean this is fantastic um, myth making so <laughs> wow and the whole world is bought into it <laughs> thank you and that's what I mean and that's why we're players in the game too okay um, Racism bio biological, but racism is real. So they do make that distinction. It's a social construct. It has created a society and social, um, what do we say, apparatuses to um, continue. We, we label it systemic racism, right? Institutional racism, where certain laws and certain practices and certain organizations are built around this concept of race, but it doesn't say race, but the effect is about race. So it gives people different access to opportunities and resources. They've created advantages that disproportionately channel wealth, power, and resources to white people. And this affects everyone, whether we are aware of it or not. Aware of it or not, and it says colorblindness will not end racism. Pretending race doesn't exist is not the same as creating equality. Race is more than stereotypes and individual prejudice. To combat racism, we need to identify and remedy social policy 
policies and institutional practices that advantage some groups at the expense of others. And if you're interested in more of this, it's called, as you see at the top, it says the power of an illusion. 10 things everyone should know about race. You'll see on the bottom, you can go online. And this was produced, um, it's a three-part documentary series that was on PBS. And they actually did the genetic testing and they did it with some young people to show the um, how different so-called races, how they were similar and how they were different. It's fascinating, but they investigate this whole thing. And what's interesting, and here's this distinction that's made between race and ethnicity. Race, and that's a classification system, putting people in um, categories, labeling them, based on surface physical characteristics. Ethnicity, and that means, you know, skin color, nose shape, eye shape, you know, hair texture, etc. Um, ethnicity is about shared history, shared culture, shared experience. So what we were seeing in that film, we were seeing different ethnicities. Yeah, they're all, in quotes, of African descent but different ethnicities, and some of whom say, no, I don't identify with the indigenous African Americans here who experience, their ancestors experienced slavery um, in North America. Their experience was totally different. Where we may have grown up with this concept, well, we're a minority, we're this or that, they weren't a minority where they were. They were a majority. You go into Jamaica, you go into Trinidad or whatever, they're majority. So I have in their head, I'm a minority. They have to learn this racialized language here in the United States around issues of being a minority or a majority or whatever. And as a matter of fact, even the Latinos, you saw the Latino man, I always love people to hear him, right? The Afro-Latino, right? Where he says, you know, people look at him and oh, man, oh, well, you go back in line, you're African-American. And then when he speaks, you know, they're like, what? Oh. And he's had um, Latinos, he said, who um, they're speaking Spanish because they think he is an African-American. <laughs> and they're speaking Spanish, and they might be denigrating him, but he understands what they're saying. So then he'll speak in Spanish and tell them, you know, yo entiendo todo. Uh, I understand everything you're saying, <laughs> you know. So. You can't tell who somebody is based on what you see. Because now what you see is not what you get. <laughs> okay? So, um, and this is especially since the 19, this was made in 2005 in the person, no, 2011 I think he did this DVD. But he's, uh, and he's from Ghana, the filmmaker's from Ghana. And um, so he came across, he bumped up against all of these identity issues and how do you identify yourself? And there is the saying, you know what? We black folks, we get on a plane at JFK and head to Brazil and we get off in um, Sao Paulo. <laughs> and guess what? We leave the United States as an African American or black, we end up there in Brazil with a whole other label. Why? Because they have a different classification system. We might have three or four or five, and they have 10 or 12, you know, from different degrees. It's like, wow, this is madness. But the whole idea about being a um, classifying people, they say that is a human trait in the sense of we want to make sense of chaos, mixed things, so we like to put things in order, put labels on them, and it helps us understand things. But the negative part, of course, is what they call stereotyping, where you know what, you put everybody looks like in the same pot, and uh, you meet one person, and they, they exhibit certain traits, and you attribute them to everybody who looks like them. And that's not true. So um, this whole concept of race, whole concept of ethnicity. Now, um, one thing, oh, excuse me, in the terms they use, they are voluntary immigrants and involuntary immigrants. Yeah, these are the folks who got on a plane and came over here, or a boat. And we were the ones, our ancestors, those of us who were of the indigenous African, we were, uh, we say, the involuntary immigrants who were forcibly brought here. Um, and I want, there's so much that can be said, but <laughs> to move forward, um, 
I want to get to this piece about Americans. See, one thing about being American, and you heard them talk about this, what am I? Am I African? No, I'm West Indian. You know, they didn't even say I'm, I'm American, I'm West Indian. Um, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be an American? And the indigenous African American has had a testy relationship with <laughs> our American identity. But guess what? We go to Africa, and so you're American. <laughs> so whether you want to carry it or not, you're carrying your Americanness with you. You may look like their great grandmother <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> but you are acting like an American. And an ugly American at that, right? Criticize. They asking for the bacon and eggs. <laughs> um, so, but what does it mean to be an American? And then now we're looking at that culture. How does the rest of the world see Americans? Whatever color, you know, so you're an American, you got that label up. And these are what they call values Americans live by. Personal control over the environment. What does that mean? We're gonna harness nature. We're gonna make it bend to our will, okay? No, not live in harmony with it, Ben, all right? And we're suffering some consequences of that perspective, all right? Change, change. To be an American, you look for change all the time. If anything lasts too long, oh, I'm bored, I'm getting, oh, change, 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 change. Time and its control. Schedule, schedule, schedules. Be on time, got to be, what? You're late, uh, da, da, da. Mm. Always schedules. Calendars, this, that, the other. Not that all cultures act, use time or see time like that. The concept of equality. Now, some of us of African descent say, well, that's a joke. Well, no, it's not because it was founded on that principle. And the idea was that, um, you know, the people who founded this country, a number of them came because they were persecuted in Britain. You know, they were indentured, you know, in debt. They were the lower classes there in Britain, so they really suffered um, with that hierarchical, stratific, highly stratified system there. And some of them had religions that were not accepted in, um, in Britain. So they were looking for a place where they could practice their religion freely. And by the way, which is one of the reasons too why we Muslims can live here, why? Because they did put in that constitution about, hey, freedom of religion. No, we're not gonna have state religion because that's what they had in England. They had the Church of England. That was the recognized religion. The United States does not have any formal state religion. So yeah, we have freedom of religion here. Um, and in terms of what does it say? All men are created equal. <laughs> and down with their creator with certain inalienable rights. Now, of course, that has said it's more in the words than it has been in its, um, what do you say, action. <laughs> um, however, just the fact that it's in the Constitution has been the, had been the basis of the civil rights movement so that you could get law, certain state laws changed based on constitutional um, laws and nobody was gonna argue with the Constitution. It was a struggle, it was a fight. Individualism and privacy. Boy, there's no, no country in the world probably that speaks more with the first, um, what we call the first person singular I pronoun. I, 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 I. I, 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 I. Individualism, what does that mean? Your primary identity is me, 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 okay? And not as much group orientation, okay? It's I, I, I. Number one, just think of all those, um, what do you call the, um, the sayings, the slogans and whatnot, always for the individual, all for the individual. Very American, which means then privacy. Listen, that's my business, you don't get my business. Um, and which is being tested now with the internet, et cetera. So this concept of individualism. Self-help, self-reliance, stand on your own two feet. Up, uh, come up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's American, okay? Guess what, competition. Competition, I'm better than you are, I got better, I got, mm, mm, mm. Competition versus what? Cooperation, okay? Future orientation, always looking to the future, always looking, oh, planning for tomorrow. What about today? And there are folks, especially Europeans, who would say, well, you know what? 
Americans don't know anything about the history because they have so little of it. So that's why they don't America's a new country. I mean, it was, what, 1776? You have countries much older. But we also have newer countries in Africa. That's the other piece about this idea of what they call the modern nation state. New human invention has created a whole other can of worms with respect to identity. How do you identify with a nation state? And if you're a new nation state, how do you become Nigerian? All right? Nigerian was created when? Uh, in the 1960s, <laughs> right? But the people who were there, what were they? They were Igbo. You know, they were Hausa. You understand Fulani, da, da, da. And all of a sudden, I'm what? I'm a Nigerian? OK, so how do you be Nigerian, <laughs> OK? That's another identity, a national identity. Mm, we take it for granted. But this is relatively new in human history. Um, future orientation, OK, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Action, work orientation, got to move, got to move, got to keep moving, work, work, work. <laughs> Informality. And people who come from cultures where it's more formal, where elders, you address them by titles, you have certain what you do not talk to them in a certain way, very respectful, etc. formal. They are always shocked with the informality of Americans. Everybody's first name, you know, talk to folks all kinds of ways. They're like right, you know, that this love you know, that they say you have no culture. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, stuff for luck. Um, directness, openness, honesty. You say, well, get straight to the point. Direct, don't beat around the bush. All right, don't, don't give me all that stuff. Tell me, get straight. Uh, I tell it like it is. I never, uh, 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 open it. Mm. Practicality, efficiency. Practica efficiency is how we do it the quickest way, the best way, the show. Ba, ba, ba. So Americans often enough, always like that. Ba, 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 ba. So they're like, People from cultures, they have another time sense, another way of moving. They're like, I gotta move away from you people. <laughs> and this last one really is one of the big ones. Materialism and acquisitiveness. Acqu materialism and acquisitive. It's like Americans, I got a right to my stuff. And a lot of stuff, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> and not the stuff I need, but stuff I want. And I see all this stuff and I want it, I want it. So this materialism, you know, and think you have a right to all this stuff, right? And so we can complain when the buses don't work right and this and that. Uh, 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 what? <laughs> Especially then when you go to another country and you say, where's the train, where's the bus? Especially so-called third world countries. Um, and the other piece here is science and technology. Science and technology that is worshipped almost like a god, they say, can solve every problem through science through and technology. So we're going towards what? Robotics. You know, they're going to have the robots to do things. you got Alexa to remind you of stuff. So what happens to your brain? You can't remember anything? you got a machine. Oh, science and technology. So what is the place of a human being in all of this? So. These are considered the values Americans live by. Recognize some of them? Right, <laughs> okay. So what is their, you know, like the opposite in terms of competition with societies? They're cooperative. They're not individualistic, they're collectivistic. How do they identify themselves? They, when they think of who they are, it's always in, in connection and relation to the group that they belong to. Their family group, their ethnic group, or whatever. So they have a strong, uh, what they'd say, then the collectivist. And I often see this with students, see when I, because I get a lot of students who are from, it's amazing, from different parts of the world, primarily third world, and they come from these collectivist cultures. They come from the cultures of, um, how do you say, uh, yeah, formality, uh, discipline, you know, respect, say, oh, but, mm, mm, mm. and they listen to their parents. <laughs> so when their parents are advising them of what to do, they listen. And they say, yes, I'm going into the medical field because, well, my parents were in that, and that's what they advised me to do. And the Americans look at them and say, well, what, why don't you decide for yourself? You're an individual. I'm a, they're coming from a totally different, why? Because their parents want the best for them anyway, so why wouldn't they listen to somebody who has their best interests at heart? 
that's not the American way. Why? Because individualism, independence, not interdependence, but independence, self-reliance is the thing. So it's like, well, be independent. I had a co-worker there at your college who was from the Philippines. He was offered a job in California, a good job, thinking about taking it. And his, he and his wife talked about it and decided, you know what, he wasn't taking it. What was his reason? Because their family was here. They didn't want to move halfway across, all the way across the country to be away from their family. So this is what I mean in terms of the iceberg concept. All of those things that are beneath that we don't see, that's what's governing decisions that people are making about their lives. And so part of this is about our own self-awareness. Who are we? When we talk about our identity, who am I? If we think about I, 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 we're thinking about one and my personality. Culture is the personality of a group of people, they say, okay? Not an individual. So. Don't we have similarities, though? You know what I mean? In Between who and who? In countries. You know, well, thinking about Russia, the competition. Yeah, and that, excuse me, that's recent. Oh. That was a communist country. What? That was a communist country. That's why we had the Cold War. We were fighting against them. Why? Their economic system, uh, their economic system, their systems of governance and social control were different from ours. And so ideologically, we were, uh, the country was, en they were enemies. Why? Different world views. Different world views. Well, now, oh yeah, sure, because you're going to beat your enemy, right? You're going to beat enemy. So it's not only American. That's what I'm. Saying. What? Oh, you mean a competition? Oh, oh, no. But this whole, yeah, the whole idea of nation state. Yeah, now I'm talking about deeply held values. See, the other piece is about, you know, well, if you're, if you got an enemy, I mean, how are you dealing? If you're at war, guess what? You're going to win. That's a European mindset. <laughs> that's, 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 that's something that they had going on in Europe that they brought over here. And when you said buying, when you said buying into whatever, it's like some of the, a, a lot of politics and stuff that goes on. Mm -hmm. And you listen to black people, mm -hmm. it's like you don't even realize that you, you ain't got a nickel in that court. Yeah, but. but Arguing that, you argue in that fight, but you, if you know the history, you'll know that you ain't got a nickel in that land. Yeah, but see, but the interesting piece is we share this land mass. And that's why Du Bois, um, when they formed the NAACP, and this was around that time of World War I, well, they were pushing for equal rights for black folks, right? But wait a minute, the country was at war. The country was at war. We weren't going anywhere. So he said, you know what? We will let you cry. They, we will stand back and black folks joined the army and went to fight for this country. Why? You share a landmass. So where are you going to go? Is somebody going to drop a bomb here? You think it's only going to hit white people? <laughs> so you understand what I'm saying? And this is about this thing about national identity. And what is it that... Um, how do you say, how do you negotiate all these identities? And you might say, yeah, I don't have a, a, a stake in the game, but you know what, it, guess what? If Hitler had won, you definitely had a stake in the game <laughs> because Hitler said there's only this small group of people who even deserve to live. You know, so we're going to, you know, genocide on all, extermination all, if you're not Aryan, you know, a certain way. So it's how you... What part of you makes certain decisions in any given situation that you're in? Well, I mean, the narrative, like you said, the thing about race, the race is not mm -hmm. being, you know, being a biological thing, but racism is very real. Mm -hmm. And race, you know, just like when you have, you know, we have discussions where people would say things like it was wrong for us to integrate. And I would ask, I would ask people, well, did we really integrate, or, or did we, um, what do you call it, assimilate? Yeah, assimilate. Did we integrate, or did we assimilate? What's the difference? You know, we well, had segregation as a law in this country, all right? So did we, did we, um, did we desegregate? 
you know. By law, or yes. Or, you know, or, or, you know, like if we live down separation or desegregation. Yeah, I'm glad you, you know, brought that up. All, all of that, you know, has to do with, you know, um, like the whole conversation. Like, you know, the sister brought up the thing about, you know, our argument with Russia. And I'm like, we have no argument with Russia. Well, we did because if they sent a bomb over here, we get it too. Well, yeah. See, this is the point. But, but I'm just saying, but <laughs> see, if you have the conversation amongst mm -hmm. each other and mm -hmm. you're not clear about certain things, then that affects whether you vote, whether you don't oh, vote. Oh, and, and who you vote. vote. Yeah, and who you vote for. You know, like, Absolutely. What does it, you know, what Absolutely. Does it mean to, to join your, your, your block association? You know, you know, you know, like I'm, I'm saying, like when I said we don't have a nickel in that quarter, mm -hmm. not to say that yeah, if Russia bombs us, it's definitely going to affect us. But I'm saying different things that really affect us, you mm -hmm. know, things that decisions well, that we make that are in our best interest. You know, we are in a lot of times we're not having those conversations because we're having well, conversations based on. It. Again, what I, I'll, I'll quote uh, Dr. John Henry Clark <laughs> again about this. People do not unite on the basis of color alone. It's about ideology, okay? So it's what do you believe? <laughs> what is your worldview? And your skin color doesn't always determine that, as we could see from here. Why? They have different life experiences, world experiences. And I wanted to point out here in terms of African Americans, we have had in terms of our orientation here to this broader society in America, a, at least three orientations. One is separation or segregation, separating, integration, or recolonization and repatriation. Let us go back to Africa. And guess what? In 1847, yes, a lot of Africans were taken, repatriated, recolonized where? To Liberia. And if you know about the Liberian conflict, that first war in the early, in 1990, you know, because they still there, they're all black people, but guess what? They consider the ones who were repatriated Americans. Okay? Yes. I think this goes back to both the sister's questions. I think it goes back to the original, your original election. She said simulation. How do you assimilate if you don't know who you are? If you don't, I, I, Easy. I, I, you ain't got nothing to You assimilate whoever is in the last structure we talked about. The, the, the American culture. Mm -hmm. But if we don't assimilate with it, then how do we go to our own culture if we don't know nothing about it? True, true. Back to what this is to say. It's the European concept is a high concept. It's not a, it's not a, a world. It's not a weak concept. It's not a well, it's not a well it's don't, f it's yes, oh, absolutely. It still is, and that's a difference, you know, from the African-American perspective and the continental African's perspective. But also, and time is going. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we have about 10 minutes more of the lecture. Okay. Okay, so there's no more questions. <laughs> Until. So we got 10 minutes more for the lecture. Then we have five or 10 minutes for questions. Mm, so we're going to yeah. not take any more questions until uh, the lecture is um, So it's always been then who are we? And if you've studied, and I'm not a deep student of African American history, but we've got to understand, when did the Africans who were brought here during the transatlantic straight, uh, slave trade, when did they become Americans and not Africans? And there is a clear distinction, and African scholars, African American scholars have identified this, the periods of when the Africans became Americans. Because don't forget, those Africans, there were Africans then who were born here after the slave trade, she probably can get the dryness, right? <laughs> Excuse me. So again, it's this thing about identity. And I think, you know, to me it's caused so much confusion in terms of uh, we as, um, in quotes, black people in America. <laughs> 
as black people in America that it's like we're stewing in our own juices or going around in circles, you know, the same old thing. I'm like, as old as I am now, I keep hearing some of the same stuff coming again. I'm saying, oh my goodness. What, oh, what is it that keeps us in this? And see, um, and this is why I also say this is about African, the African American Muslim. Uh, but this is. Oh, uh, yeah, I wanted to finish that part about uh, Liberia. And so, in terms of their ethnicity, even back then in 1847, there were those Africans who were considered more American than African by the Africans. And they still have those cultural conflicts there in Liberia. They know they're distinct groups. And they say that those repatriated Africans did, never really integrated with the, um, what's the names, the, uh, the indigenous peoples there. And I think it was the rubber company, what's that famous rubber goods? Firestone. Firestone, was it? Yeah, I couldn't remember, it was Firestone or Goodyear. I mean, they had a stake in the rubber plantations there too. So they could help foster a division between those people of African descent on that landmass. So this whole idea, again, like I said, of identity, We've been caught, I call it like caught in that trick bag because wait a minute, you know, we keep talking, we're going around in the same circle. How do we break out of this circle and what are we headed to? What do we want? You know, and that was an old saying used to be, you know, talking about you people. What do you people want? <laughs> what do you people want? Um, and by the way, I don't know how many of you are aware of this or remember this, but the Nation of Islam, its first resurrection. They advocated separation, <coughs> separation of black people from the white people. What was their rationale? You know what, this hasn't worked, right? This hasn't worked. You, you white people know it, we black people know it. So let's come to another solution. Why don't we just separate? Now we had so many years of unpaid labor in this country, so we sort of have, you know, some credit. <laughs> then let's identify a particular number of states in the United States where this will be for black folks in America and separate so you don't have to deal with us anymore. We will be there. I don't know how many of you remember that, but it was about separation of the races. All right? Has it worked? No problem. Well, it didn't happen, okay? Um, so yes, this has been considered. And I'll tell you, just a quickie, um, a cousin of mine, after she retired from teaching education, uh, she took, it may have been the Peace Corps, um, she went to Liberia to help train the teachers there. And um, she was there maybe two weeks or three weeks. The Civil War, that first Civil War in 90 or 91 broke out. And guess what? She said, we got word that from, through the United States Embassy, you know, all the Americans who were there, okay, it's getting dangerous, we're moving you out, okay? And they were told when to go here, to get there, to get the plane, they were getting the Americans out. She said, a young teacher she was working with, a Liberian, you know what she said to her? She said, you're very fortunate. Your country takes care of its people. Moved them out. It wasn't about color. You're white or black or whatever. You're American. Oh, get your bags packed. We're getting you out. Move. Okay. She said when she got back to and uh, got off the plane there in Kennedy, she wanted to kiss the ground. <laughs> Some of them do that. They're those who do kiss the ground. They do. <laughs> so while we talk about. America and what it means and this and that. Why is it so many people want to come here? <laughs> Why have they wanted to come here? There are things that we take for granted, like, for example, public education, free, what? And they give you books? You don't have to pay fees. You don't have to pay for the books. These are students, I think, they're like, wow, that's why their parents came here. Whoa, you got, and then they look at the African Americans who are poor students, not interested in school, and that like that. And they look at them like, no, you are not my people, <laughs> right? They say, what? 
education, that's the key, what? And guess what? That used to be the saying of um, the, your, the indigenous African American. Education is the key. Get education. They can't get it in your head. They can't take that away from you. They can take your money. They can't take your knowledge. Blah, blah, blah. And yet, I see so few indigenous African American students in the classroom, in the college classroom. I'm like, where are they? Where are they? And I see all people of color in their classroom. And they are from the islands, they are from Africa, you understand? They are from Asia, they are from, and I'm like, they even, have, well, they got some white ones too. They got the, um, uh, what do you call it, These Ash, the Uzbeki Jews who have a big community in Forest Hills and Queens who even come there. And I say, where are the indigenous African Americans? Where are they? But that's it. So then you look at the social issues, you're like, whoa. Yes, our community has suffered in many ways, but also um, this whole idea of schooling and education is like, mm. and that's and this gets to the last part I want to get to because, see, we talk about the issues, and that's why I put Dean in there, because if, as um, Dr. John Henry Clark said, a people do not unite on the basis of color alone, they unite on the basis of ideology, then if we are African American and we are Muslim, then we are united by what? To me, it's Islam. Why? Because we may have had a lot of different life experiences or histories, and as those people were talking there, yeah, from an American, African American, yeah, but my people originated from Ghana, you know, whatever. But if they embrace Islam, then what unites us? Our historical experience? No. Our Islam, our deen, deen Allah. And that's the thing is, how do we as African Americans, uh, let me get to that, Salima, because the idea, yes, that is an ideology. Islam, we talk about it as deen, not just religion, we talk about it as deen, a way of life, which means that all of these values, it has beliefs, it has values, it has norms, it has culture. There is an Islamic culture that is built on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his prophet and his messenger, alayhi wa salam. But if we don't know that, then we just gonna be plain old black folks, <laughs> okay? Or African Americans. So the question is, what is the ideology, what is the culture that is developing us? And when I kept thinking about this idea of the race thing, I say, you know, the Europeans created this, but yes, we have bought into it hook, line, and sinker because we have been impacted by it. But, and this is, this is to me, the hard part. What do we believe? Do we believe in Allah? Do we believe that Allah is real? Because, and I have a cousin who is, He's not religious at all, um, but he knows a lot about Africa because he lived for a while in Africa and every, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, um, you know, the one thing I always appreciate about it, Islam, there is no picture of a deity. What? So you can't say, well, the God is white, so that's always only for white people, or that's only for black people. There's no deity. How much do you believe in the concept of transcendence? meaning above and beyond this human existence because that's what it means to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then what does it mean to trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that if we're blaming the white man the white man is not God and if you think that that the that's the God that's gonna solve problems? I don't think so, okay? But if you profess Islam, then you're professing the creator of all that is, was, and ever will be. And is the omnipotent, the all-powerful. So if we are not seeking the favor of our creator, and we're looking for the white man, We've missed the point. Why be a Muslim? You know what? Just be black <laughs> and fight. <laughs> you understand? But if you are a Muslim, 
how much of that is in your cells? And I should say our cells. How much of that is in the atoms that make up who we are? How much of that governs our culture, our marriage and family system, our supernatural religious system, our systems of governance and social control. See, social control begins, and if you read the works of, you know, of, well, of Islam and um, Al-Ghazali, when he talks about, yeah, it's internalized. You've got to go inside. You have to introspect. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verily, um, we do not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. So what is revolutionary is Islam. That's what will change us and change the situation. And they say, you know what? If you can't change a situation, you change your attitude towards it, and then you do certain other things. We don't know what kind of creativity can come to us if we really understand the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we believe in the unseen? Do we believe? No, well, you show it to me. That's what I believe, what I can see, right? But you can't see Allah. Yet we're told that Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. And also that we've got the recording angels here. So number one, we are never alone. We are never alone no matter where we are. And if we act like we are, then we don't believe Allah. Allah is with us. Even in the misery and the suffering that we may have, Allah is with us. But what's the function and the purpose of that suffering? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know what, this life is indeed a test and a trial. What's your test? How you get through it, <laughs> you know? Adhering to and understanding what is it, the legislation I have laid out for you. And then you will know some of paradise. You won't know the changes until you believe this deen and you believe it and you act like you believe it. Not that you talk it, but you believe it. And I know how many of you ever watched these, what, Indiana Jones movies? Um, there was one, I always, because to me it's like a metaphor for faith, where there's one, I think it's the, was that the one where they tried, you remember that that scene is a scene where they have to cross this channel like how, well that's where the ark is you know how are we going to get there there's no ladder there's no rope there's no this no that no there's something there there's something there and it was like step out and then she stepped and then he threw some rocks out and it showed it was like a, a transparent a translucent the Last Crusade, The Last Crusade, okay. <laughs> and I said, what a metaphor for faith, for Iman, that you step out there on faith because you know Allah says, I answer the call of the caller when the caller calls on me. If you don't call on Allah, you don't believe Allah. You don't believe Allah is there. So if we're just focused on this identity called African-American, well, I'm black, I'm this or that, but you are Muslim, then how does that transform your African-American identity? Because African-American culture has had to take on some very negative characteristics that have been self-destructive. Does that mean we continue with those? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no. We have some of the highest, you know, death rates in terms of stroke, obesity, health problems, uh, things we have broken physical laws and spiritual laws and social laws. But that's us as human beings. That's us as human beings, all humans do, right? But then if you say you're Muslim, then you say I'm about change. Otherwise, why be Muslim? You don't have to be Muslim. There's no coercion in Islam. You know? So you don't have to be Muslim. But then the question is always, then, well, what kind of Muslim do you want to be? And first, you've got to un have the knowledge of the deen. Because if you haven't been, and, and we always go by, well, what my mama told me, what this told me, and that. Well, if what they told you was consistent with Islam, then that's fine. But if it wasn't, who gets priority, mama or deen? Mama or Allah? Abraham said, I got turned away from what my um, 
my parents said, you know, that wasn't right, right? So if we haven't let go, whoa, let go and let God, remember that? If we haven't let go of some of those, how do we can cha change our condition? And then look at the self-identification. The sister who was in there who said, I'm only Muslim. Okay, that's what she chose. She chose. Okay, that's going to be her primary identity, right? But if you say, well, I'm black and that's it and everybody else, then where does the Muslim come into that? So constantly we're supposed to be learning about Deen Allah because you can't do what you don't know. So we must learn. We must study. And Allah has made us that way. We're like humans. He made humans as learning. We learn until when? Until he calls us. Yeah, so we're not, none of us is finished yet. Why? Because we're still here. We still have work to do. And Sheikh Amin was here. What was he talking about? He said something about, you know what? You got to do the work. If you, those of you were here and heard Sheikh Amin, he said, you got to do the work. What's the work? It was the inner work, that work on self. The work on self. What, you end up the transformation, because that actually, and you know a lot of our ancestors, indigenous African Americans, were very religious people that believed in God. And they stepped out on faith, you know, and some of them died for it. They got killed trying to get the right to vote. You understand? But they said, you know what, I have faith because God is on my side. Because we're right, we're seeking justice, and God is a God of justice. So. What do we believe in terms of Islam? And one last piece, and that was about what do we, how do we, how, how do I say this? We live in the American culture. Every culture, you know, this thing I read about time, has its time and has its rhythms. We're living on a Judeo-Christian calendar. So our rhythms are locked into that. Oh, good. no, I can't come to Salat al because I work that day, right? Because the work day here is, you know, Monday to Friday, right, right. Why do we have Saturday and Sunday off? Oh, guess what? Saturday is the Jewish holy day. Sunday is the Christian day, right? Oh, wow. So we are operating off a whole other, ca not a Muslim calendar. So in a sense, we are unconsciously in that rhythm, in that rhythm. Certain of our holy days, no, well, I couldn't get off from work. Oh, guess what? We're always off on the Christian holidays. Why? Because the whole place shuts down. So we don't even know what it means to be in the rhythm of Islam. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Saudi Arabia. And I remember you know, saying that to the Sheikh, um, and he says, well, you'll see, because those of us who reverted early on, you know, way back when, we were very romantic about Islam and Muslims. You know, everybody, you know, their feet didn't touch the ground, you know, all of that. And he said, but I said, I don't know what it's like to hear the Adhan five times a day. So that's my rhythm, the rhythm of life. No, 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 all right, right. So it's almost like your body goes into it. Don't know what that's like. What is that like to be surrounded by all Muslims, to be on that clock? And so you know what it was? Oh, you know what the work week was? The work week was um, Saturday through Wednesday. But that's when we taught. Saturday through Wednesday. Why? Because Salat al Juma is Friday. Off. Oh. No, that's the weekend, okay? We don't understand that. So we don't understand what it means to live an Islamic lifestyle, where it is part of our pores, part of the rhythm of our lives. So it is more difficult for us, but that's the challenge and that's the test. And Allah said, I don't give you a burden greater than you can bear. So we can do it, and alhamdulillah, we have help and work in this country, in this environment, to get the Eid off, you understand? So we have the means by which we can move parts of our culture into the broader culture. And that is a fight worth fighting for, especially if you're not going to migrate, if you're just going to be here. So you're just going to say, well, uh, that's just the way it is. No, that's the way you choose to leave it, because <laughs> you're not going to push for it. You're not going to do the work, and you're not going to do the struggle. And that's part of the task, I guess, we have as Muslims here in the United States, to make our life viable for the world to understand here in the United States of what it means to be Muslim. And we have begun to educate people, especially in New York City, about this. 
So I say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we are Muslim. Alhamdulillah, that means Allah blessed us. And we as African American, what, any Muslim, because there are a lot of immigrants don't appreciate their Islam anyway, um, to understand what it can do for us as individuals and then as a group, inshallah. Shukran, and I thank you for your kind attention. And let me, any, any errors I have made, please, they are mine. And any truth or knowledge, <laughs> any truth knowledge, alhamdulillah, it comes from Allah. <laughs>